This week, the pursuit of creativity brought me to etiquette expert Thomas Farley, also known as Mr. Manners. In addition to being a keynote speaker, workshop leader, and TV commentator, Thomas is on a mission to answer the public's modern manner questions. Think less what fork do I use and more how much do you give for a wedding present? In this episode, we talk about the importance of pivoting within your own industry, the power of surrounding yourself with like-minded friends, and cover tons of these modern etiquette questions that you can definitely relate to. My name is Aiki Ajvan, and welcome to the Pursuit of Creativity podcast. Thomas, welcome to the show. Aiki, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. I, I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, last time we met, we were hanging off the side of a building. The first time we met, we were hanging off the side of, the, of a building at a press event. Um, so we didn't get a whole ton of time to talk, but I'm excited to kind of jump in and, and learn more about uh, what you do. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was a pretty death-defying, adrenaline-inducing event. So hopefully uh, our, our podcast conversation can happen in a little bit more of a a sedate setting than, than the last time we were together. <laughs> yeah, a little less adrenaline, a little less, you know, fear, uh, <laughs> a little less stuff, but uh, I'm excited for it. So f- to kick things off, um, can you just let us know like where you're based, where you're located and y- your full name? Sure, yeah, so I'm Thomas Farley, I'm known in the media as Mr. Mayors, and I am born and raised in the Northeast, um, went to school in New York City, which is the city that I call home. So I I live in Manhattan. Uh, So I'm a proud New Yorker. I love that. New York, I mean, I'm a New Yorker as well. I grew up upstate, so I'm a New York City transplant, but I I love it here. And uh, um, it's cool to to keep meeting people from the area and then seeing how they've stuck around and, you know, are building their career in this area. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, for I think for what I do and for what you do, Being in New York, being that it's the media capital of the universe uh, and being that it's just constantly got an influx of new and interesting, fascinating people. um, I I just I find that I give a lot of energy to the city, but I derive triple when I put in. Uh, So this is this is a great place to be as as any kind of content creator, I believe. Oh, yeah, I I totally agree. People ask me like, what, well, what's so great? I'm like, it's, it's hard to describe, but the energy, like you just, the people, it's just all there. You, once you're here and you're, and you're doing creative stuff, it's, it's very easy to, um, feed off that energy in like the best possible way. Totally. So let's shift gears. I'd love to hear about your background. So you mentioned the media, the world calls you Mr. Manners. And I want to get to that name a little bit down the line, but let's let's back up. Let's hear some of the job history leading up to where you're at now. Sure. So, uh, so when I was young, when I was uh, a grade school student, it was my dream to be a TV reporter. And I've got all these book reports. I was actually just with my mom over the weekends, visiting for the long weekend, and I'm um, going through some of the childhood book reports that I wrote. And it was always. You know, there I there I am. You know, on the scene as a as like a little second grader. You know, this is Tommy Farley reporting live from the scene of the such and such. So television and telling stories was always really a big part of my dreams when I was a young child, and uh, went to Fordham in New York and studied. Started out as a communications major and ultimately switched over to political science. I found that it was something about poli sci that was really engrossing for me, and I loved it. Um, but as I graduated, I kind of had multiple things that I was interested in. And I found myself working in an area that I had not specifically studied, which was magazines, magazine publishing. And uh, I loved it, Ike. I just, there's something about creating a physical product at the end of every month that you could hold in your hand and flip through and give us a gift or see it on a newsstand or be at the barber and see somebody reading a story that you wrote uh, not on a phone, but actually in their hands was really an exciting thing. So I, I really burnished my credentials working in the world of magazines. And it wasn't until I ultimately landed uh, a job as a senior editor for Town & Country magazine. And mm-hmm. talk about a, a position that afforded me. I felt like the world was my oyster. I mm. traveled to Antarctica to do a story on uh, the journey to the last continent. I drove an Aston Martin in the south of France. I interviewed so many celebrities for cover stories. It was really, it was a great, great gig. But as I was gradually looking more and more at what was happening to the publishing world and the publishing world and the folks around me who had kind of spent a lot of time, far more time than I had 
in the industry, it was definitely changing. And with the the booming of social media and online video, video on demand, podcasts, it was becoming clearer and clearer that to spend the balance of my career working in magazine publishing might be a mistake because it was an industry, mm. that, much as I loved it, it was disappearing before my eyes. So I had to really think, well, what do I do? How do I, how do I take all the skills that I've polished and worked on and the credentials I've built, the contacts I've made, being in the world of publishing. So I knew writers, I knew artists, I knew TV folks a bit, um, I knew book publishing folks. How do I take all those contacts and my, and my love of crafting narrative and take it to the next level? So one of the things that I was responsible for while I was at Town & Country Magazine was a column called Social Graces. And mm. Eggy, it was, it was such a fun column because it looked at just kind of quirky etiquette issues that affect all of us on an everyday basis. So when people think about etiquette, they think, oh gosh, you're talking about what fork do I use and how do I manage my knife properly without looking like I don't know table manners. And yeah. yes, that is definitely a slice of what etiquette is all about. But the far more relevant areas, I feel, are things like elevator etiquette, who gets off first, the, the things that we really yeah. deal with every day. So that's what the column dealt with. So every month we would look at a different issue of contemporary etiquette and behavior. And ultimately the column became so popular that we created a book called Modern Matters. And so I edited, it was an anthology. I edited it. My photo was on the book. And as soon as the book hit the newsstands, television stations started calling and saying, could we get Thomas Farley on? We love this concept of etiquette that's not fussy, it's not old fashioned, it's not cranky, mm -hmm. it's not judgy. It's just, it's relevant to everyday issues. And so the median started calling and it was great for me. Like my dreams as a second grader of being on TV were all of a sudden being realized when I kind of far put that in the rear view mirror. I thought, well, I, you know, I made my bed with magazine publishing and that's where I'll be for the balance of my career suddenly all these TV opportunities were arising. So it was such a thrill and remains a thrill. So that's where it began. And, uh, you know, it was really, uh, you know, when you start out, you're invited to be on a local affiliate on yeah. Sunday morning at 6 a.m. And, you know, when you prove that you can actually handle that, then suddenly it's Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And then it's, mm -hmm. you know, Monday at 9 a.m. And, and little by little by little, I really started to be uh, get to be known by a national audience. And and I just, I, I, I know we'll talk about this more. I just consider it such a privilege to be able to get this message out in a really meaningful way. And I think what's going on in our culture right now makes the sort of conversations that I do have in my role as Mr. Manners supremely important. Totally. Wow. That is such a cool backstory. I love that it went from like, you know, relatively very traditional to like writing a book. And then now you're doing this, you're, you're spreading your message on social media, you're, you're on all these news segments. I love that it like went through this evolution and back to your original goal as a kid. So that is really, really awesome. I love, I love to hear it. And my next question for you, I have a lot of questions based on all of those things, but, um, first and foremost, uh, what are, so just to bring the audience up to speed, what are some more of these modern manners that people can expect? I like what you're saying. That's more of the things that it's more every day. Cause like, I remember in my business class, we had a, like a, a business etiquette, not etiquette class, but just like a, a standard business class. And one of the things was like, how do you eat at a business dinner? Like what, literally what you're saying, what fork and whatever. So what are some of the more modern ones that are more applicable to, I think the everyday person? Sure. Absolutely. Well, I've got to tell you, so New York Magazine, you and I both New Yorkers, as we've discussed, New York Magazine, just a couple of weeks ago, did a big cover story on the new etiquette and the rules that we need to, to be abiding by in 2023, not even 2021 or 22, but 2023, the things that we need to know. And this magazine, this magazine cover story got so much coverage. I was in, I was not any part of the story, but mm. given what I do, I was invited to commentate and offer my thoughts on it. I have to tell you, I disagreed with about half of wow. the etiquette that they offered in this story. There were, they brought up some great issues, but their takes on it, I thought some of them were, were just way off base, but it, it covered things such as 
um, ghosting a first date. So if you have a first date and it goes really badly, do you need to be in regular contact or follow up contact mm -hmm. or you just ghost the, the first date? It talked about um, how you properly split a check when you're out with a group of friends. Should you be all paying the same amount? If someone drank a little bit more, or the other person only got an appetizer, what's the etiquette of that? It talked about this real trend that we're seeing, and I've been talking about this a lot in my segments, of um, what is known as um, both tipflation and tip creep. Mm. So this idea that everywhere we go in our everyday lives, every time we get a coffee, a muffin, uh, you name it, we're being asked, would you like to tip 20, 25, 30%? So these issues uh, are really kind of, they've been thrust on us. We've, we've just come out of a pandemic. We've now got the pandemic officially ending in May uh, from a, um, a government standpoint, as far as mm -hmm. the age that we're living in. And I think for a lot of people who spent, most of us, who spent several years kind of clustered inside with our, our little bubble, now are out and about, and the technology has, has marched on, and our etiquette needs to adapt to this, the changing mores that we're seeing, whether it's how we interact with our friends, how we interact with our romantic partners, uh, or how we interact with members of the public or those in hospitality. And so etiquette is always on the ready, which is what I love about it. It's always on the ready to step up to the challenge of giving us a set of guidelines, a set of recommendations, that we can live by. And that's really the heart of good etiquette. It's not about making people feel inferior. It's not about making mm -hmm. people feel like, oh shoot, I don't know the rules and now I feel stupid. Far from it. The idea of etiquette is that it's adaptable. So the etiquette of a hundred years ago, guess what? It's not the etiquette of today. And that's a good thing. Cultures adapt, societies adapt, and so does etiquette. Um, so that basically, as long as we have a similar common playbook, a commonly accepted guideline of what is good behavior, and we all are, are familiar with it, that allows society to, to flourish and to function in a way we're not inadvertently offending anyone or um, using bad etiquette without knowing it. Totally. And I think I, I can definitely, I felt that when I was like, when things started opening up in New York, I was like, wait, how do I act again? Like, what do I do? What's acceptable? So I love the idea of that there, there being some like, base level or like relatively agreed upon rules. So everyone can be like, okay, I feel pretty good about this. If there's something special, obviously for different people from different cultures or different places, that's, that's different. But as long as we have like a good baseline, I feel like everyone can like, you know, enjoy that and agree on that. I like that a lot. Yeah. I mean, if you think about even going to a wedding, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know when the first time you went to a wedding was, but you were probably fairly young, you know, maybe you were mm -hmm. 10, 11 years old. You know, these are situations that don't happen every day, and yet there are guidelines for what to give, how much to give, you know, when, how long to stay, when to RSVP. All, all of these things, if we, if we generally follow these guidelines, it allows the interactions to happen that much more smoothly. And, it, and the important thing there, once we get, this is, if you think about etiquette as like the business side of any interaction. Once you get the business side out of the way, you know, when should you RSVP, how much do you give, then you can really focus on the enjoyment and, and the being mm. present and not worrying, oh, did I do the wrong thing? Because in fact, if you're familiar with the commonly accepted guidelines of etiquette, then you most certainly have done the right thing. And now you can just enjoy yourself. That's so true. I have had many conversations where I'll look over to my partner, I'm like, how much is, is this enough for the gift? Is this not enough? I'm like texting my sister. I'm like, is it, how do you do it? Like you're a little older than like, it's so, it's so true. I feel like that would be such a weight off the shoulders to get that information. And I'm sure it's cool that you are like, you've crafted this area in society where you get to help people in that way. Um, so let's get to the name, Mr. Manners. Is it a self-appointed name? Was it something that came from the book? Was it something that people just started calling you? I'd love to hear the story. Sure. Yeah. So I, I wish I had some phenomenal story for it. Um, and I and I wish also I could truly pinpoint it, but it was there was something that started happening little by little, as I mentioned. So I was still at the time I was still at Town and Country, going out doing all this TV. And at that point, I was Thomas Farley, senior editor, Town and Country. When I left the magazine, people, I, I really, frankly, I I thought that that having that credential uh, 
affiliated with my name no longer. So no longer was I at the magazine, but that really might mean the end of having this platform. And I was, I was sad about that, the prospect of it. But in fact, what happened was completely the opposite. When I no longer had the affiliation with the magazine, I found myself to be even in more demands than ever. And that's mm. when the big, big TV invitations started happening. Um, I think it really began someone or a few people just started to say, wow, you're a regular Mr. Manners, aren't you? And ah. I just, as I was thinking about that title, it seemed kind of whimsical. It was fun. I will tell you though, before I officially adopted it, I gave it a lot of thought because, mm -hmm. well, for two reasons. Number one, you call yourself Mr. Manners and boy, oh boy, your behavior better be <laughs> pitch perfect in every single interaction. You are not allowed to be cranky or mean or sad mm -hmm. or grumpy ever in public or with your family and friends who really hold you accountable. You know, yeah. okay, Mr. <laughs> Manners, right? You know, wow, that wasn't very mannerly, Mr. Manners. You know, and I am the first to say, I, like all of us, am a work in progress. I do not consider myself perfect and I don't judge. I really don't. If somebody comes to me and they want advice and they're looking mm -hmm. for insights and it's something that I've either gathered historically or from through my experience and I do, maybe we'll talk about this as well. I, I do programs and keynotes at conferences mm -hmm. around the country. So I'm constantly hearing from individuals who are just regular everyday folks about what bothers them, what they feel etiquette issues should be focused on. So I use all of that data, that anecdotal research that I'm doing all the year through in my TV segments. But um, mm -hmm. so I was worried though, as I mentioned at the outset, calling yourself Mr. Manners, that's a really high bar. Um, but then the second thing that concerns me a bit was it also could potentially make you seem like you're someone who's just really fussy and crusty and judgy. Yeah. Well, like some guy who, you know, he wears bow ties and fun, funny little glasses. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like I didn't ever want the etiquette to become a caricature. Uh, although I do actually have, I think you've seen it, Ike. I do, I do have a, a caricature um, that I use in all of my branding. But it, yeah. when you see it, you realize, okay, this is, this is not like your grandma's etiquette. This is, this is not something that's crusty and fussy. So it was, it was some de deliberating that it did at the time to say, okay, it's, it's cute. It's it, people get it right away. Yeah. Uh, but could it be, could there be a backlash, uh, to using this, but it's worked out really, really well. I would say the worst thing that ever happens if, if anybody ever knows in advance that I'm going to be at a dinner party, for example, often people will say, I don't, I don't know if I want to sit next to him <laughs> because they're worried, <laughs> yeah. they're worried about their dining etiquette, which of course I'm not, yeah. I might be observing it, but I'm not, I am definitely not judging it. So, and I, I put people to ease right away. They, if they thought about that and had that fear in advance, once they meet me, that usually fades, fades away very quickly. Yeah, totally. I can, I, those concerns I feel like are super valid. I, I was like, when I first saw it on your Instagram, I was like, oh, this is an amazing branding and this is spot on. I love that. Um, but yeah, I love, I like, I love the, 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 the taking a look at and examining how this could affect you in many different aspects. I feel like for a lot of people that have like, uh, a persona or a name attached to them, it, it can, to your point, put them in a bad, bad position depending on what happens in the future. But it sounds like you've done the research and it's, it's working very well for you so far. Um, so why don't we circle back to um, our time on the side of a building really quickly, because that was uh, a really cool press event for a new show called Limitless. And I was there for the job I work and you as Mr. Manners and plenty of other reporters and, and article writers and things like that. So I would love to hear um, if you could share a couple other experiences of like cool press events you've got to go to as Mr. Manners. Sure. Wow. So there, there have been a bunch. Um, something that I don't know if you know about my career background, and we haven't even touched on it in this conversation. Um, shortly after I left the magazine, shortly after I left Town & Country, I was really interested in the power of video and the, the immediacy of video. And so... I created uh, an online streaming uh, network, TV network called New York Insider TV. And it was basically, oh. it was like entertainment tonight for New York City. And I would go out a couple times a week and I'd be on the red carpet 
interview and I had a, I interviewed celebrities, but when you when you're doing a cover story of a celebrity for a magazine, you're usually in a restaurant and you're having a meal or like I interviewed Pierce Brosnan, for example, at his home in Malibu and you know, sat down mm-hmm. and we had lunch and, you know, looked at the beach. And so there are a lot of kind of environmental things that you can bring into your into your narrative when you're having that type of experience for a magazine feature. A red carpet interview obviously is a completely different animal. It's fast and furious. You are there, Mm -hmm. you're immersed in the situation. And and as a reporter, you're often asked to be on the carpet a couple of hours before the event actually starts. And you are routed like anything. They give you an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. That's the amount of space your body can occupy. And then you're kind of there with your microphone during your interviews, trying to get people, celebrities to come over to talk to you who may or may not know who you are. So in that role though, I did a ton of fun, fun events um, and met so many fun celebrities and really just loved that whole experience of being like from the Time 100 Awards, for example, to uh, an event where John Bon Jovi was being honored, uh, the food bank for New York City. So some really cool events where I was covering um, press events like the type that you and I were on at the edge um, and and live for the show Limitless. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I, I drove an Aston Martin in the a DB9 in the south of France Ooh, when the, the that's cool. was just being <laughs> unveiled. Um, I've actually driven, speaking of driving, I, I've driven the um, Bugatti Veyron, which wow. is or that costs just about, and I think now it does, or over a million dollars. Uh, this car. <laughs> which, Wild. <laughs> can I tell you, if you ever wanted to feel like you were just panicked about, I, I was worried <laughs> if I put the the blinking the directional signal on that I was going to break something. I didn't want to, right. you know, bill from Bugatti after my drive. And I think the day I drove it, it was a it was a driving rainstorm. So that really that enhanced the fear. Oh, oh wow! Oh my gosh, got it. You know this this baby may be capable of three hundred miles an hour, but better keep it to thirty. So <laughs> there probably Honda Civics that were passing me on the road. I was in this this amazing sports car, but that was pretty intense. Um, going to Antarctica was was absolutely just an extraordinary experience. It's a uh, a two day sea crossing from the tip of South wow. America, a, a city called a little tiny city actually called Ushuaia in Chile. Uh, from there over the Drake Passage, which is where the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans converge, which means it's the rockiest sea crossing anywhere in the world. Right. So, and yet, and it's two days to get to Antarctica from once you leave South America. So, uh, but getting there and mixing and mingling with penguins and walruses and seals. Um, yeah. So I really, I love to travel. I've had the, the opportunity. I think one thing I really, really just cherish and never take for granted is that as someone who is a writer, as someone who is a journalist in many facets of what I do, I do a column for the Edison Today Show, for example, um, there's really no person that you can't pick up the phone and call. There's no email that you can't send out requesting an interview. And seeing, and, and you know, so, and if you were doing anything else, people would think, who is this wacko? Why is this person calling me? But as a journalist, as a writer, mm. you have carte blanche to reach out to some of the most fascinating people and help tell their story and help you help have them help you tell a larger narrative. So I feel really fortunate and I know you do too, just this ability to kind of collaborate with and work with anyone who you so choose as a means of, of telling a story. So um, some great stories completed, some great stories still to tell. Yeah. No, that is amazing. That's a really good point. I, I, I love the, the, you know, the, the expression of gratitude and excitement about being able to talk to these amazing and brilliant people. I, like you said, I, I feel the same way that I get to do this kind of stuff in my job, too, um, with these people in their selective field and stuff. But it is that is really cool to hear that there's all these opportunities for people that um, as a reporter and a journalist and things like that, that, that that's out there. Um, <clears throat> but I want to also touch on because that's like that's the more extravagant exciting side of things, but there's obviously more to that, right? There's a whole other side to it. So could you walk us through, and you, you alluded to this a little earlier about the different things you have going on, speaking engagements and, and seminars and things like that. Could you talk to us about um, some of the other things behind 
Mr. Manners. So like you said, you had a column, you do these speaking okay. engagements. Give us a, a look behind the curtain, all the things. Sure. Thank you. And you know what? Those are equally exciting. They're just not always as public facing. So, mm. and what I love about what you're doing with this podcast is really kind of showing the way others have the paths they have taken as a means of shining a light for others who might be interested in doing a similar thing on their journey. So I think something that your listeners might, I hope, will find of great interest was, so there I was, I had left town or country. I was suddenly being asked on every TV show going, I mean, it was just a dream and again remains a dream of dreams to have that platform both because I love TV, love, love the news media, um, but being able to reach an audience literally of millions was yeah. very exciting. Um, but I had a really interesting challenge. And that was when you're asked to be, you're not a full-time staff member at any of these shows, you're asked on as a guest, you're asked on right. as a commentator. You typically, and it, with very few exceptions, you're not being paid, you're being invited on, with the the kind of the quid pro quo being, well, we're giving you airtime, you're getting yep. publicity, and you're giving us your ins insights and your time. And although a segment that I might do only is three minutes or four minutes, the amount of work that goes into those little three minute segments, you're dealing with a producer and coming up with talking points. This this happens sometimes over weeks leading up to those right. three minutes that you wind up getting in a TV set. So it is, it is quite a lot of work and you're not being compensated. If I were someone who was out there selling bow ties or selling, uh, you know, skin creams or something like that, as part of my segments, it would really be genuine publicity for what I'm doing that you would right. think would lead to increased business as a result of the exposure I was getting. And the case of, of the uh, TV rollout that I had early on, I was out there, I was on TV, and the TV really had nothing that it could promote other than me as someone who could talk about these things. I wasn't, literally wasn't selling anything. I had no business. This really wasn't anything that I even thought was a business. I thought, right. well, this is terrific. I, I love, I love <laughs> this, this platform that I have, but, but that was pretty much the end of it. I ultimately thought, this is nuts. I have a challenge that most businesses would be aching to have, which is more publicity than you know what to do with. Mm -hmm. How do I take all this publicity that I get and do something that, that is in alignment with my brand and alignment with, with Mr. Manners, but that it can also allow me to make a living uh, as it was becoming a bigger and bigger part of my time. And so ultimately I thought, there is a need for this, and this is what I was hearing about. Anybody I would meet at a party and at events, at a convention, they'd say, gosh, what you do is so important. Can you teach my team how to do that? Can you teach yes. my, you know, my, my sales staff how to do that? And the more I started hearing that, I thought, huh, I never really considered it. People had often told me you'd be a good teacher. Maybe I should think about this. So I started about it was like eight or 10 years ago, I started mm -hmm. offering primarily to law firms and banks who have summer programs where they have their summer interns. And mm -hmm. I would do courses on professionalism. I would do like the course that you took on dining etiquette. Um, I yep. would do those courses and I suddenly realized, wow, there's a huge demand and a huge need for this. That being said, I also realized this is not the core, this is not all I can do. I'm so much about right. communication. I'm so much about being the best version of yourself. I don't want to be known as that guy who does the, the plate course. I really wanted to be known for something bigger and to me, far more broad reaching. And so that is what I do now, Ike. So my programs, uh, which I do, I have about 40 different programs that I, that I teach on. I have keynote speeches that I instruct. Um, and deliver at conferences. So I travel around the globe and uh, primarily North America doing programs for teams, big and small. Sometimes it's a team yeah. of six or 10 people. Sometimes it's a team of 30 or 40. And what's really exciting there is I have worked with no exaggeration, literally from coal miners in West Virginia wow. to Native American Indians in Washington state to Disney executives in Burbank, 
um, and everything in between. I've yeah. toured like the the plant of a, a, a perfume factory where they fill the perfume in the bottles and been there to see that and experience all of that. Um, I've worked with companies that do a linens for restaurants and and wash the napkins and, and been on their floor and, and ask, gosh, how do you get wine stains out of a tablecloth? And so the, the journalist in me is always learning and always, mm -hmm. I find there is no such thing as a dull person. There is no such thing as a dull job. There are only dull questions. So mm -hmm. the chance to get out and, and meet people and, and learn about industries that you never even knew existed, uh, or if you did know they exist, you never thought you'd have any contact with them, to be able to right. bring my message of considerate communication and being the best version of yourself to all these different professionals all around the country and around the globe. I love it. I love it so much. That is so cool. Yeah, I, I that is exciting. And I love, you know, to hear the, the, the point about like these TV um, appearances don't necessarily get paid yet. If, oh. Like they create a, a way for you to make your own path, which is like you said, one of the things I'm super excited and want to share with people on this, on this uh, podcast. And I would love to hear, you know, a little bit more about, so these courses and these speaking engagements were a lot of, was it a lot of word of mouth? Were you like going on forums? Like how did, like for someone listening, that's like, well, I want to, I can do that. I have a, I have a specialty area. I can sell to people. How did you find some of these opportunities? Sure. So one of the things that I did at the outset was I realized I had a bunch of friends and I wish I'd known you at the time, Mikey, because I would have definitely looped you into this group. I created a group called the Experts Collective. And this group was, Ooh. I would be in a green room at a TV show and I would meet the, you know, the different version of me who did something entirely different, but had a similar path. So my friend, Andrea Surtash, for example, who was one of the most foremost and is one of the most foremost experts on dating and relationships. She and I kind of bonded and just talking and, and we realized, gosh, we've got these these burgeoning careers where you could be on CNN one day and, you know, I mean, quite candidly, the next day as you're kind of still building, thinking, you know, should I just take a job at Banana Republic? I mean, I, you know, should yeah. I just go back to the corporate world or should I go back to the, the, you know, the sinking ship of magazines? So you have the benefits and you have the vacation pay and all, you know, there's, there's an allure of that. And, you know, there are some days when, you know, again, early on, if things were a little bit slower, you'd really start to question yourself. And having people who understood that completely because they were doing the same thing, they were like that swan, you know, gliding along the surface of the water, but furiously paddling underneath. Yep, underneath. <laughs> right, unbeknownst to, to everyone looking, all they could see is the beautiful swan. You know, you're on TV, you'd think, wow, you know, this guy's made it. You know, he is set, he's ready to go. And yet they're business-wise, there were still challenges. So. Um, realizing that that it was hard to get other people who would understand that experience unless they were doing a very similar thing in their lives, I formed mm -hmm. this group, the Experts Collective. And so we had the travel expert and we had the organization expert and the dating expert and the fitness expert. And it was, we were kind of all of us together. It's almost like like the Hall of Justice or the Justice League. Yes. Know, like from DC love, Comics. Love the connection to superhero themes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And we, we really, it, it did not happen. And I'm so sad. Maybe someday it will, but we really, we, we envisioned that one day we would do kind of like, and it was just such a mixed group of people, but it'd be like, like a queer eye for the strig guy kind of concept, except it would be, we would just, all of us would swoop in and whatever, you know, it, say it was a family where the mom needed career counseling, the kids had terrible manners. Uh, the dad was really poorly organized. They wanted to take a vacation. The teenage son had dating problems. We'd all kind of swoop in and just fix everything that this family had that was not working as well as it could. Uh, that did not happen. But what did happen was the sharing of common interests, of goals, the brains. We would meet once a month and we would just mm -hmm. talk and we would talk about our business challenges. We'd talk about what was going on. And that cementing of connections is really, there were several members of the group who said, Thomas, I really think you need to be out there doing workshops, doing keynotes. This is, why are you not doing this? And they mm -hmm. very generously, because none of it was competitive. We all worked in such separate verticals. 
None of it was competitive. They started sharing contacts with me. I started sharing contacts with them and it just built from there. That is, that is so cool. Two things. One, I would watch that show. So if and when <laughs> it happens, like sign me up, I'm, I'm fan number one. Right. Um, but two, I, I, I think what you just touched on, I usually like to ask people how their career has like affected their friendships or their mental health or like Oof. the people around them. And it sounds like, um, and, and please elaborate if, if there's Oof. more, but it sounds like you have used it to cultivate even better relationships with people that are doing similar things to you. I, yes. And, you know, that's not something that I typically am asked about a lot, but it's such a great point and such a great question. I find we talked about you being so cool, and that's probably the reason why you're surrounded by so many cool people. Um, I think for me, I am very entrepreneurial and I'm very creative, and I've had to reinvent myself as we've discussed during this conversation. Mm -hmm. I find that I really gravitate most strongly to whether it's friendships, whether it's romantic partnerships, whether it's business alliances, to people who are also really creative and dynamic and self-starting entrepreneurs. Um, if, I, if I were to catalog my closest, closest friends, and I do have some friends who are lawyers and they work for a law firm or they work for a mm -hmm. bank and that's their thing and that's great. Um, but I sometimes struggle to really connect with them on a deeper level in the sure. way that I can with people who have that same entrepreneurial fire and that creative spark uh, and the ability to reinvent. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really, I think it's super important. That's something I've, I'm working on too, is like getting people, I have lots of friends in different areas and things like that, but not as many that do like content creation or like okay. things like that. So that was one of the reasons I like was like, oh, this podcast is going to be great because I'll make friends, I'll get to connect with friends <laughs> and like start to build out that, that uh, collective of people that Justice League of, of superheroes, nice. if you will. Um, all right. I have uh, two more questions for you. Like, the way we like to end the podcast um, is the first question is um, we live in a world that is we're going through it in a lot of different ways. And I feel like there's not usually a great opportunity for people to brag about themselves or the things they're working on or just something exciting. So I want to give you some space to talk about maybe something you're hyped about, something that's coming up, something that's happened in the past. You've already talked about a lot of cool experiences. So if you have another one you want to share, I'd love to hear it. Oh, thank you. Well, I mentioned it briefly and it's really, it's still, although it's about a year in, it's still in its nascent stage, but I'm doing a regular column for NBC today. Uh, the column is called Meal Time with Mr. Manners. And what's been super fun. Great name. The branding on the par. Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. yet again. <laughs> well, that's, that's key. Uh, and I actually have my editor. I, I can't even take credit for coming up with the name of the column. It was, it was her suggestion, and I, I love it. Um, we have been tackling such seemingly arcane topics in the column, but they resonate like you would not believe like the column I'm working on this week which will be long since published by the time this podcast airs um is on how long you should wait before ordering once you've sat down in a restaurant like Ooh. how long is too long uh yeah. you know, and and when is when is a server being annoying if they keep coming over you know are we ready do you have any questions can I take your order and you literally sat down 24 seconds ago um, or you sat down 24 minutes ago and you said, oh, mm -hmm. we haven't even looked, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so some really kind of fun, quirky topics. We did one on, uh, should you, if you're in a restaurant, should you stack your plates as uh, oh. a courtesy to the server who's trying to clear the table for you? So, uh, you know, that's, I've never been a server. I've never worked in a restaurant. So for that one, I interviewed servers and I got their input. Yeah. What do you? What do you like? Do you like patrons to do this? Do you not? The answer, their answer was no. We appreciate the gesture, but leave the stacking to us. Interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, hey, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, for me too. So the column has been super fun, uh, and I'm I'm just when you ask about like what's next, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where that can build. So I've got uh, multiple ideas for some documentaries uh, based mm -hmm. around. I'd love to partner. Know anyone? Love love to partner partner with Netflix on a doc because I, I think the the fact that we're talking about these issues now and everywhere I go I hear people just fascinated at having these questions I know the interest is out there so uh, so that hopefully if we're if we're talking again in a, in a year's time or maybe even six months time uh, we can talk a little bit about my documentary 
Yeah, that's I've I've had this uh, thought with a couple of guests for this first season. I'm like, I definitely need to have like a a, a first season like catch up in like a year or two or whatever, mm-hmm. and just to see where people are at. And ideally, when we do that, because I'm I'm saying we're gonna do it now, we'll be talking about your documentary, which would be really cool. <laughs> Fantastic, and you'll be you'll be invited to the opening premiere. All right, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> we'll watch that, and then we'll have another screening for the other show when you have that going. Yes. Um, Okay, so our last thing, I like to do this because I love this. I would love this to be a very actionable podcast. I hope people are inspired by hearing your story, hearing what you do. Um, But if you could give um, the listeners three tips, they could be long, they could be short. Um, If they heard what you're doing, the cool stuff you have going on, and they want to kind of go down that path or just when you're curious about it, what would you tell them? Sure. Um, So I would say for starters, my number one question that I used to ask when I was a little kid and my, I would drive my siblings. I have three, uh, two brothers and a sister. I drive my siblings crazy was the question, what if? I would always, you know, be in a situation, what if such and such? And they'd look at me and they would say, that would never happen. That can't happen. That's impossible. And I, so I really believe firmly in the power of asking what if. Even if the rest of the world around you thinks that what you're talking about is preposterous and impossible, um, it doesn't have to be. And if you've got the drive and the interest, uh, you can make it happen. So I love, I love being able to ask what if. Just if only in your own mind to explore alternative scenarios, I think it's, I think it's a great philosophy to have. So what if is my guiding philosophy? Um, I would say, and this kind of tags in nicely with what is, what if, um, so my second piece of advice would be, um, think long and, and clear before you ever say no to an opportunity that's offered your way. And I can mm-hmm. point to so many times in my career where for a variety of reasons, I was, I was too overscheduled. I, the money was just ridiculously insulting. Um, and for whatever reason, I decided to say yes to the invitation, whether it was a part-time gig or an assignment, uh, or, or frankly, even just a, a party at networking reception where you just, you were feeling exhausted and somebody spontaneously said, hey, we're, you know, we're having this, would you wanna come? Kind of tempted to say no. Um, I think mm-hmm. the power of, of being able to say yes, even, even when you're not entirely feeling it, I think so many times it's those specific occasions when we've said yes, when we were tempted to say no, where we actually find the best results. And the last one, I believe is, and I, I shared it earlier, is um, that I don't believe there is such a thing as a dull person. Uh, mm. I, I think it's really easy uh, to just size people up by how they look or how they talk, uh, or just think that they are either gonna be uninteresting or if you're looking to network, of the zero value to you. And for that reason, look, we live in a, in an ADD, always on hyper rushed culture. It's easy to just pass these people by because we just think that they really are of no value to us. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think sometimes the people who you would very easily disregard uh, are the ones that you'd most likely um, forge a really fascinating connection mm-hmm. with or learn something from. And in fact, so I have, if we have time, I have a little small, small example of that one, which I think is kind of yeah, please. And, and, and interesting. So I was having some work done on my apartment uh, over the summer. And one of the workers was just very quiet and, you know, but, you know, these people are coming into your home every day. You want to, you know, offer them water and snacks and, and just try to engage them in some sort of conversation. Little by little, he started opening up. And one day out of the blue, he says to me, um, you know, I, you know, so I'm thinking like my dream is to, I want to buy a house in London and do this. And, and I'm thinking, well, like, good, for, good for this guy. He's, he's yeah. really ambitious. I, you know, I hard to do that working as, as like a construction assistant, but okay. And I said, oh, how many years do you, do you think you'll need to continue working to, to be able to achieve that dream? And he's like, oh, I can do it already. I said, wow, oh, that's great. Congrats. He said, yeah. He said, you know, tickle me Elmo. And I said, yeah, sure. He said, well, I was, I was the tickle me Elmo boy. And I said, Whoa. what do you mean? And so the tickle me Elmo, which of course was like the hot, hot, hot 
Christmas gift of, I don't know what year it was, 1993 or 1994. Yeah, I was going to say, I had one when I was a kid. (laughs) Okay, yeah. So every, you know, every child across America wanted Tickle Me Elmo and no store shelves had them. Um, He was the boy on the box, um, like holding Tickle Me Elmo. And I think it's, I think the, you know, the caption from Elmo was like, that tickles. Um, But this, this little child model from 30 years ago, uh, was was financially set, but but more important than and and good for him. But more important than that was what resulted was this completely unexpected conversation of someone again. I could have just easily skipped over that mm. conversation and just thought I need to go on to more important things than speaking to somebody who is a contractor's assistant. But I didn't, and that's not who I am. And just learn this really fascinating tidbit about someone that would I would not have learned had I not been open to. So never thinking that anyone in your midst is dull and being willing to engage with them and listen. I love that. And I mean, if you aren't inspired before, after hearing these three tips, I feel like you have to be, I know I am. This has been such a great conversation, Thomas. I really appreciate you like taking the time and hopping on here and sharing your story. And hopefully those listening got as much out of it as I did. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Mr. Manners, I appreciate your time. We'll have to get together soon. And um, again, thanks for being on the podcast. Anytime. Thank you, Ike. Thank you so much for listening to yet another episode of The Pursuit of Creativity. If you enjoyed Thomas's story and got some value from it, be sure to leave a rating or review. As usual, check up Believe Divergent for any updates, BelieveDivergent.com and the Believe Divergent Instagram. Once again, I'm your host, Aiki Ajivan. Thanks again for watching. We really appreciate you. And as usual, stay optimistic. Better days are coming.